I'm Don Dix, and I have the privilege of being a co-host on two radio shows here in the Inland Empire. Uh, they're both broadcast out of AM 590, The Answer. One is the Jen and Don Show, and it's heard daily between 6 and 7 in the evening, 5 and 6 in the morning. And then Saturdays, we have the Unite IE Radio Show, and it's heard at 4 o'clock and sometimes at 8, if you're lucky. We will air twice uh, on Saturdays at some point in time. Uh, my gateway drug into this, uh, having the privilege of being behind a microphone was really community activism. I got involved originally in uh, national security related issues, wanted to educate the community, and found out very quickly that the conservative voice in the Inland Empire was fragmented. We had a lot of groups throughout the Inland Empire and there was no connectivity between them. So when we found that out, we realized we needed a little organizing and out of that grew the Unite IE Conservative Coalition and then the Unite IE Conservative Conference that happens once a year during spring. I've got a lot to say about people being involved in politics and having the hard political conversations. Um, first of all, the proper care and feeding of a republic demands citizen involvement. Uh, there's a famous quote by Ben Franklin. Uh, he ran into uh, a socialite that he knew, Mrs. Powell, after the ratification of the Constitution. And Mrs. Powell asks Ben Franklin, what form of government have you given us? And Ben Franklin replies, a republic, madam, if you can keep it. Now in context back then, uh, the reason why he said that the way he did was that women could neither vote nor hold political office. So why would Ben Franklin tell a woman, if you can keep it? It turns out that the proper care and feeding of a republic requires all citizen involvement. In fact, she was the person who was responsible for George Washington running for his second term because she was involved in politics. She understood you know, the role that, oh, that you know, we all have as citizens in maintaining the republic. Well, fast forward to today. Um, today, we don't teach civics in elementary school anymore. I grew up in Baltimore in the 60s and early 70s when civics was still taught as a regular part of you know, giving, you know, the children of America an understanding of what it means to live in a republic and the responsibility we all have of being involved in that. Uh, Judge Brandeis said, and this is a really important quote, uh, the most important political office in the entire country is that of private citizen. Judge Brandeis was on to something and so were the founders because they realized that any government it left to its own devices tends to grow and accumulate political power. And it was up to citizens being involved in that to keep the balance of power in check by getting rid of the understanding of what people's role in a, a Republican form of government was by eliminating civics out of our elementary school, uh, by eliminating the foundational history and the role that the founders had in their vision for what a Republic is. We literally have edited out now the importance of having those political conversations and people being involved in politics, not so much running for office, although that's important, but by keeping the politicians in check by you know watching what they're doing at school board meetings and city council meetings and county government. What's happened is we've given up our political power to our elected officials. The, the uh, Section 2, Article 1 of the, uh, unless I have that reversed, of the California Constitution says all political power is inherent in the people. But we no longer understand what that political power is, how to wield it, and how to keep government in check. And as a result, we have what we have today, bureaucracies running amok. Uh, citizens reeling in shock over some of the laws that are being enacted at the local level, the Sacramento and in the federal government. So getting people back involved in politics is one of the most important things that we can do. The best way to get conversations started is to stop talking. Now, what I mean by that is, is that when, when we become exposed to what we think are some of the problems, the first, our, our natural inclination is to turn around and do a data dump into someone else's head. 
we got to learn to stop talking and start asking questions. And this really came to me as a result of a lot of the sales training I had. The first rule is that the person who's asking questions is always in control of the conversation. So you got to stop talking. And if you feel like you're start like you're talking too much, you're losing the conversation. You need to be asking people questions and then speak those answers into their listening. So the, the, the big problem is we're trying to sell a perspective to someone. You know, we've got our belief system, they've got theirs. Telling isn't selling, asking is. The people want to know how much you care before they care how much you know. So when you start asking people questions, it gives them the feeling that you care about what they think and feel. And it also gives you the ability to control the conversation. So by asking questions, and it can be something as simple as, hey, did you read that article that it just came out about whatever? Um, I mean, and there's plenty of fodder with what comes out of Sacramento. So for instance, um, you can say, man, it sure seems like the crime is ticking up in our state with all this criminal justice reform. Did you hear about uh, AB 1810, which was the add-on bill to uh, a, a health uh, legislation that essentially now creates a way for criminals to use the, uh, the possibility that they have a mental illness to get out of paying the penalty for that crime so they can claim that. There's so many different laws that are being enacted. You can start conversation with that and, under, and, and get to know what is it that those people feel about that law really feel about it to remove remove the the uh the political divide the republican versus democrat and just ask them hey do you hear they they're trying to ban straws for pete's sake what do you think about that well it's ridiculous and then you can give them some information about how little straws make up of plastic waste and just get them focusing on man this the the you know the these people are trying to pass laws well intention maybe but it's completely pointless. And with San Francisco dealing with the homeless crisis, there, we got way more important issues than, than straws. But people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. So ask them questions and learn what they feel about it. And that's the best way to keep the conversation going, not try and do a data dump into their head. The traditional ways that we have of getting educated about what's going on in the political environment have become so corrupted. They've actually sort of become indoctrination zones, not information zones. So you really have to root around a bit. I, I think um, our schools ultimately should be an area of focus. So become educated about what the schools are teaching kids, both primary and secondary, because schools have become indoctrination zones. So if you're going to take some time to become educated, involved in politics, learn about the politics of education, learn what's going on in our, uh, you know, elementary schools, in our junior high schools, what they're being taught about things like sex ed, uh, the history of a variety of different cultures, uh, Islam, the history of our country, the history, because all of these areas of history have become uh, areas where kids are being indoctrinated. Um, and become an advocate for them. I mean, especially when you learn about uh, this new sex education uh, agenda and uh, curriculum that, the, that it, our kids are being exposed to, that should outrage every parent about what they're learning. I, I can't even talk on the radio about some of the things that our kids are learning in elementary school, because it's forbidden for me to use some of those terms in a microphone, and yet they're being coming commonplace in junior high and elementary school. So learn about that as your launching off point in politics, and boy, you, you'll be amazed at what's happening in, in our primary and secondary education, particularly universities. 95% of all of the professors in liberal arts hail from not just the left, not just Democrats, but many of them are hard socialists and communists. And they're the ones teaching our kids these days. No wonder our kids come out of school with their brains scrambled. The Republican Party is really the party that, of foundational values, along with small government, limited regulation, liberty, free enterprise, capitalism. And 
part of the problem is that the the media and the political left has taken control of the narrative. They're defining who the Republican Party is. And the Republican Party, for to a large degree, has lost its ability to define itself, to get its message out. Um, right, In fact, right now, the Democrat Party is almost redefining itself, and a lot of the media has bought into this as the Democratic Party. And this drives me nuts because they're not Democratic. They're Democrats. The Republicans are Republicans. And so when you really, you know, just even in name only, you know, we are the party of the Republic. We believe, I mean, to a large degree, the Democrat party is taking the country in a progressive uh, neo-Marxist socialist direction. Look at the people that have become the darlings of the Democrat party. Um, all of them, you know, are people that espouse this new democratic socialism. So if ever there was a time for the Republicans to regain the narrative, it's today because the Republic, look at what's on our California flag, the California Republic. So we need to, we need to learn how to take back the narrative, describe what it is about a Republic that makes it special, that makes it unique, spanning uh, thousands of years in the way governments have formed and realize that this experiment in government is the only government that really has at its core the preservation of individual liberty. I was blessed early on to be able to have a conversation with Brandon. And after talking to him for an hour, I said, I bet you within 48 hours, you're on Tucker Carlson. And the very next night he was. This movement is so important because people who have been leaving the Democrat Party not the Democratic Party, the Democrat Party for years have not had a voice. They've been hiding from their peer group. They're losing friends. They've lost friends and family members because, you know, the biggest thing about the it's almost cult like. In fact, Brandon talks a lot about how it is sort of cult like what the walk away movement has done has given these people that have walked away from the Democrat Party for a variety of different reasons and walked away from liberalism because they have tacked so far left and become socialist that they don't even recognize their own party. But the walk away movement has given them a voice. It's given them a platform. You go to the uh, Facebook uh, page that they have where you can see these video testimonials of people talking about why they've walked away and what they're walking into. It's just astounding how many people have uh, come out of the shadows. It's almost like people coming out of the closet, you know, when you know, they were they were gay, they came out of the closet, but politics has almost become that today. People are afraid to come out in their communities um, and acknowledge that they're walking away from the Democrat party and it's given them a voice. It's great what he's done. You know, the Republican Party is completely misunderstood today because they've lost their voice. They've lost their voice because right now the media at lar writ large has become the PR arm of the Democrat Party. They are the ones that are defining Republicans as being alt-right, as being white nationalists, as being racist, as being uh, you know, fail uh, greedy, you know, the one percenters. Uh, I'm certainly not a one percenter. I have no very few one percenters. What we love is we love personal liberty. We love freedom and we love limited government. Taking away our rights as government grows is not Republican at all. And yet, unfortunately, far too many Republicans in the lawmaking process have become a part of that swamp. So we need to take back the narrative and take it away from the media. I'm not sure how to do that. I have a voice, you know, behind a microphone. I'm trying to encourage people to stand up and, you know, be more vocal about what it means to be Republican, to be involved in their local forms of government, whether it's city council, school board, or county government, run for office, uh, support those that are running for office, because Lord knows this midterm cycle is critically important to maintaining the window that Donald Trump has opened up. And it's not so much that Donald Trump is the great spokesperson for that, but the window that he's opened up is the opportunity for us 
to regain a foothold in leading the uh, direction that this country is headed away from progressivism and socialism and back towards that Republican form of government limited, uh, rolling back regulations and expanding personal liberty. There are several key areas the Republican Party can improve in. First of all, they can go after the minorities that have become the nesting ground for the Democrat Party. When you look at the Hispanic community, their, their values as families, it marries up perfectly to Republican values. You know, they believe in family. They believe in uh, many of the uh, faith-based values that we share. And so we need to become better communicators of that because the last thing that the Demo, I mean, when you really explain what the pro-life movement is versus the pro-choice movement, many of them are like, well, no, life is sacrosanct, even in the womb. So when you, when you start engaging them at that level, they begin to realize they are Republicans in the basic fundamental values that they hold. We just need to do a better job of reaching out to those communities. This is why it's so important that people get involved in the political process. There are several key races throughout the Inland Empire that I can point to. One of them is Ali Mazari, who is running against Jose Medina. You know, Jose Medina, we had a very tragic situation in Paris where there was a family called the Turpin family where 13 kids were found to be living in really horrible conditions. What, did, what was Jose Medina's response to that? His response was to, we need to regulate homeschools because look what happened. One family ends up having problems because they claim to be a homeschool family. And Jose Medina goes on this uh, binge of wanting to regulate all homeschool families. You know, that's a slippery slope because what happens next? Oh, you have a gun in your household. Well, you can't have a homeschool because you've got a gun in your household and kids could be in danger. You got people on medication. They can't be in that home because what if they, you know, that's not an environment. Oh, what are you teaching your kids about faith? You're a Christian family. Well, when you're teaching your kids about, you know, the, the, the curriculum, you can't weave in your Christian values into uh, the homes. That's the road that Jose Medina was going to set us on. And that's why I'm so happy that someone like Ali has stood up and said, we can't let this guy run unopposed. At least let's have a, a conservative that will op oppose, you know, Jose Medina and, you know, give a voice to these Republican values that Ali believes in so dearly and that he's benefited from so immensely. He's a hardworking guy. Uh, he has, you know, a great work ethic. He's built a great business. He's the kind of person we should be celebrating in our in, in the Inland Empire.